Now, what I'm saying is admit the, the tremendous uncertainty of our lives. We all need to find a way to meet difficulties, crises, challenges, the problems, the troubles, to understand, to transform, to overcome them with deeper acceptance and insight and compassion, and so able to discover the peace of mind, stability, and fulfillment that we need so much to face the challenge of the world today. That's the end of the talk. Everything is, is in that, actually. <laughs> now, regardless of who we are, the main purpose of our life, you could call it the heart of being human, is to be happy. Now, this is quite a lot of this, the first part, about inner contentment and happiness, are based on the message of his own Dalai Lama. I always, wherever I go, I try to communicate his message, particularly on peace, inner contentment, compassion. So I try to share at the beginning of this, which is that if you look closely, we can see that there are two kinds of happiness. One is based on physical comfort, which we can call the uh, happiness of the senses or the happiness of the pleasure. The other is founded on a deeper mental contentment. In Tibetan called Chohi. The one can be the first one can be very expensive <laughs> and often unsatisfying. But the other one that is the deeper mental contentment, if you're able to acquire that, is not only is inexpensive but can be completely satisfying. As Socrates, the ancient Greek philosopher, once said, Contentment is natural wealth. Luxury is artificial poverty. As it says in the Bible, be content with such things as you have. That's from the Hebrews. If we have food and a roof above us, let that be enough. That's from Timothy. And for I have learned in whatever state I am, therein be content. In fact, interesting, it's very similar to what the Tibetans say also. You see, as you, long as you have a roof over your head, food in your stomach, that's what's called happiness. What we need is very much the contentment, the choshe, enough is enough. As Prophet Muhammad said, riches come not from an abundance of worldly goods, but from a contented mind. Also Shakespeare said, my crown is in my heart, not on my head. Not decked with diamonds or Indian stones, not to be seen, my crown is called content. A crown it is that seldom kings enjoy. As Buddha said in the Dhammapada, which is one of the most important Buddhist scriptures, in that he said, contentment is the most excellent wealth. And as a great Indian master called Nagarjuna, who's only second to Buddha in his greatness, he said, there is no treasure like contentment. Or he further said, of all the types of wealth, it is contentment, which was said by the teacher of gods and men, that's the Buddha, to be the most supreme. Strive for contentment, and should you achieve it, even without material wealth, you will truly have found your fortune. Is that clear? The time and effort usually people spend on accumulating and maintaining material or outer wealth affords very little opportunity to cultivate inner wealth, qualities such as compassion, patience, generosity, and equanimity. This imbalance leaves people particularly vulnerable and completely at a loss 
when it comes to dealing with the challenges of life when it presents themselves. But if we have this deeper inner peace and contentment, this inner wealth, then even when we go through suffering, our mind can still be happy. This explains how that there are some people who can have every material advantage and yet remain dissatisfied and discontent. While there are others who are always satisfied and content, even amidst the most difficult of circumstances. I think once his own Dalai Lama said, I think in New York, you might be owner of the, this great skyscraper. You, you have this beautiful apartment on the 100th floor overlooking the Central Park, which is the best view. Uh, but if your mind is messed up, only thing you're looking for is a window to jump out. <laughs> so, you see, you notice that even when you have physical comfort, after a while, it, it becomes old, isn't it? After a while, first it's this kind of novelty, then it wears out. Then when you really have the kind of the suffering and mental turbulence, none of these outer paradise can really do any good for your mind. So that's why his holiness, you see, I often remember when people ask him, what is the art of happiness? Uh, I often heard him say that, granted that external situations and circumstances can to a certain extent, you see, contribute to one's happiness and suffering or well-being, but ultimately happiness and suffering depends entirely on a mind. And that is to say how the mind perceives through the five senses. So in fact, you could say the principal characteristic of genuine happiness is inner peace and contentment. If we have contentment and inner peace as your basis, as your ground of your being, then your mind will be relaxed and at ease. If your mind is relaxed and at ease, then no matter what difficulties or crisis you encounter, you will not be disturbed. Your basic sense of well-being will not be undermined either. As a result, you'll be able to carry on your everyday life, your work, your responsibilities more efficiently, and your mind will have the wisdom to discern what to do and what not to do, and in turn, your life will become happier. And even when difficulties rise, you'll be able to turn them to your advantage. So, for your own inner peace and stability, taking care of your mind and heart is crucial. Once your own mind is more at peace, then both inner and outer harmony will automatically follow. Now, I want to share with you a little bit of the essence of teaching the Buddha. Uh, teaching the Buddha is very vast. I think some people may not realize that. Just what Buddha taught alone, what's called the word Buddha, a volume over 100. So Buddha's Bible is not just one book, 108 volumes. Not to talk of the work of the great Indian masters, which volume over 200. And this is not to mention about the work of the great Tibetan masters. So it's the teaching Buddha is very vast. But at the same time also, it can be essentialized. In fact, uh, you see, there is the vast way is the way of the learned and the pundits. The vast way. Like, for example, his Dalai Lama, when he was trained, he took 21 years of education to complete his education. So that is the, really the, the way of the learned. But at the same time also, when Buddha was asked what is the essence of his teaching, he was able to sum it up into just three lines or four lines. He said, Dikpa Chum Mijasin, Gyawapun Sum Sopa Che, Ranga Simdi Yung Sum Dindin Sangye Tenma. Do you understand? <laughs> now, when you roughly translate this into English, he says, Commit not a single unwholesome action. Second, cultivate a wealth of virtue. 
thirdly, to tame this mind of ours. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Now if I take one by one, each line, in fact the entire hundred volumes of the teaching of Buddha can be summed up into just three lines. Whereas from these three lines, my master used to say, a learned master can enumerate into volumes. In fact, for those of you a little bit familiar with the teaching of Buddha, there are three different levels of the vehicles of the teaching of Buddha, sometimes known as three yanas. In fact, these three lines are appropriate to each of the different vehicles. First of all, the most important thing, first one, is commit not a single unwholesome action. Now you might say, but how can I possibly not commit a single unwholesome action? Did you get the point? If you were to ask. Well, when the real masters, when the lamas actually explained, they said, what it really means is that as much as possible, abandon all the unwholesome, negative, and harmful actions of the body, speech, mind. Body, speech, mind are three doors. We call them three doors. Meaning through these three, we do either positive things or negative things. Is that clear? Body, speech, mind. But of that, mind is the boss. You know that. So first line is, as much as possible, abandon all the unwholesome, negative, and harmful actions of the body, speech, and mind, because it is the cause of suffering for yourself and others. Basically means that if you do not want suffering, then we must abandon the cause of suffering, which is ignorance, negative emotions, and negative actions. You got it? On the other hand, if we want happiness, then we must cultivate the cause of happiness, which is developing wisdom, which is the opposite of ignorance, and loving kindness, compassion, the positive emotions, such as that, and then positive actions, which are the cause of happiness. Is that clear? So basically, first thing is, if you do not want suffering, then most important thing is to Abandon harmful actions of the body, speech, mind. Whereas if you want happiness, then to cultivate positive emotions. Wisdom, positive emotions, and positive actions. Is that clear? Very simply. And in fact, the first line, the masters always say, the great Tibetan masters always say that, if you cannot help, at least don't harm. Most important, don't harm others. And most important, don't keep malice in your heart. No black heart. Don't keep malice in your heart. Keep your mind and heart pure. See, if you cannot help, at least don't harm. In fact, this first level, this one, is related to what is called the basic vehicle. If you were to relate to the three uh, vehicles of the teaching Buddha called that the uh, basic vehicle or the root yana, within which the Theravada tradition is also. Then there is the Mahayana or the Bodhisattva yana, and there is the Vajrayana. I mean, those of you know that. Those of you who don't know, don't worry about it. Is that clear? In fact, the first one is related to the basic vehicle. In the basic vehicle, the main practice, of course, is shamatha, of calm abiding meditation and clear insight of Vipassana, and the realization of egolessness, but also the practice of refuge, in which the main precept is the precept of the Dharma, which is refraining from harm, not harming others. So most important is not harming. The first line is not harming. You got it? That's how the Isun Dalama's teacher, Chabji uh, Tree Rinpoche, used to explain that. Now the second is the cultivate the wealth of virtue. Now before we come to that, first of all you see, um, I mean as the Dhanis Dalam often used to say when he first came, I had the um, great privilege of actually a uh, little bit involved in organizing Zulun's first visit to the West in 1973 when I was in Cambridge that time. 
I accompany him to the Rome, to the Vatican, to Switzerland, and then to the England. He also came to uh, my college. In those first visits, he always used to teach, he used to say, my religion is very simple, my religion is kindness. You know, he always talk about the importance of good health. As I said earlier, many Tibetan masters say, if you cannot help, at least don't harm. Remember? At least don't harm. Most important is keep a good heart. In fact, there was this great master called Tsongkhapa Pachimpo, who was the founder of the one of the schools, great schools of Tibetan Buddhism, called the Gelugpa tradition. And his name was also Lozong Tapa, meaning the one who's known uh, as the good heart. And he often used to, whenever people, when we meet or greet people in the morning, normally you say, oh, how are you? How is your dog? How is your cat? How is your health? And how is your weather? Instead of him asking that, he would always say, how is your good heart today? Every day he would say, how is your good heart today? Because most important is good heart. Good heart. And how is your good heart today? So... During that first visit of his own, he often used to say that, you see, of course we want to think of ourselves, we want to take care of ourselves, but you see, in taking care of ourselves, he would say, don't be foolishly selfish, but wisely. It's our right to think of ourselves what's good for our own interest, but if in so doing, don't be foolishly selfish, but look and see what is truly beneficial for you. And then when you look from this perspective, you realize that actually, you realize that when you harm others, actually, it harms you. And when you help others, it helps you. Is that clear? So that actually harming others is not in your good self-interest. Helping others is in your enlightened self-interest very much. If you really start thinking long term, actually harming harms you. Helping helps you. And then from that, when you really realize more deeply, you realize that actually your happiness and your suffering is connected with happiness suffering of others. That means that we are all interconnected. We are all interdependent. When you realize that, then first you might think of what is really good for you, but then when you realize on a deeper level, that harming others harms you, helping others helps you, then you realize that actually our happiness sufferings connect with happiness suffering of others. And this inspires actually altruism. Which later when you develop into actually compassion. And so this view of interdependence is actually very important. In fact, uh, if you were to say because there are many levels of the teaching of Buddha, but on a very basic fundamental level, if you were to say, what is the most important Buddhist philosophy? Now, philosophy is, of course, when you say the philosophy, it's when you don't practice, you call it philosophy. <laughs> but when you practice, it's called the view. <laughs> what is the most important view in Buddhism? Is that everything is interdependent. Everything is interdependent. In fact, actually, if I go a little bit further, actually, the real is, is that, you see, uh, the fallacy we have in this world is we think everything is permanent and things are singular and that we are independent. So the entire teaching of Buddha from the very beginning up to the highest teaching of what's called Majjhimika uh, refutes that how things are actually not permanent but impermanent. Things are not singular, but multiple. Even ourselves. You, we say, oh, yesterday I did this. Actually, yesterday you is not the same as you today. If you really examine it. And we are not independent, but we are made of many, many things. So we're all interdependent. So the fundamental view of Buddhism is everything is interdependent. Everything is interdependent. And this is, of course, very much evident now in the world, what's happening in the world. Now, his own Dalai used to say, this view of interdependence is not just a Buddhist philosophy or Buddhist view, 
but it can be very practical. How can it be practical? Is that, for example, let's say uh, somebody really, really makes you angry. And when you, somebody makes you angry, then you just use that particular person as the target. You blame that person, saying, you know, that you get more and more angry. I think according to scientific research, all the neurons gather together in your mind, saying, you know, this person is terrible, or that person is terrible, then make you more and more angry. That's how anger grows, because you have this target, someone you blame. But that's actually too simple. That we believe a kind of an independent one particular person is the cause of it all. But actually, if you look really deeply, really examine deeply, that you realize that actually that particular situation, circumstances, came not only from but one person's you know, kind of a, a mess or fault, even though that person can be a, a kind of an important link, but you realize that there are actually many, many causes and conditions. Many, many causes and conditions. It's not that simple. In that also you yourself may be implicated. When you're able to think back this way, bring your reason. You know, I mean, I'm sure sometimes you may notice that you blame somebody, but actually you, it's a little bit your fault. But you don't want to admit it, but inside you're kind of saying, you know, it's not that person's fault altogether. You know, something like, so when you begin to actually realize that you see there are many, many causes and conditions, that then your initial anger, initial, you know, this anger to that particular person or the target diminishes, diminishes. And as it diminishes, it brings non-violence, non-harming. The view of interdependence brings about non-harming. Is that clear? So we can say fundamental Buddhist view is, or philosophy is, interdependence, but fundamental Buddhist practice or conduct is non-harming. And that is indicated by the first line, commit not a single unwholesome act. Say that, commit not a single unwholesome act. Which means as much as possible abandon all the harmful negative and unwholesome action, body, speech, and mind, which are the cause of suffering for yourself and others. On the other hand, the next line says, cultivate the wealth of virtue, which is to develop, adopt as much as possible all the positive, wholesome, and beneficial action, body, speech, and mind, which are the cause of happiness for yourself and others. It is said by also this great Buddhist saint, called Shanti Deva, he said, all the happiness there is in this world comes from thinking of others. All the suffering there is in this world comes from thinking of oneself. Yeah. These are really essential, very important points. Is that clear? I mean, you notice that they are very much similar to the teaching of Christ also, and to the Ten Commandments. Second, and cultivate the wealth of virtue, as I mentioned earlier. If you do not want suffering, then we must reduce our ignorance, negative emotions, negative actions. You got it? Which are the cause of suffering. Whereas if you want happiness, we must develop the cause of that, which is wisdom, which is opposite of ignorance, positive most such as love and compassion, and positive actions, which is benefiting others. And that is the second line that is the basis of the Mahayana, which is really much engaged in the practice of loving kindness and compassion. Now the most important is the third line. Third line is Ranga Semdeyons in Tibetan, which means to tame this mind of ours. In fact, interesting, Ranga Semdeyons, Rang means oneself, Sem is mind, Yons means thoroughly, completely. And those means to, to tame, to transform, to subjugate. It just tame your mind, doesn't seem tame somebody else's mind. <laughs> Ranga Samyons. A true spiritual practitioner is somebody who mind his or her business first. Charity begins at home. <laughs> you know, act locally, think globally. <laughs> very much, you see, very much, you see, working with yourself. 
Really, a real true spiritual practitioner is somebody who applies the teachings to his or her well-being, which is the well-being of others anyway, ultimately. And so the most important thing is Ranga Samyongsundu, to tame this mind of ours. Because you see, when you harm or when you help, really, you know, uh, actually, you see, we may do things through our body, through our speech, but actually, really, the boss is the mind. Body and speech are merely subservient to the mind. Mind is the boss. Is that clear? The motivation. That's why the motivation is very important. Motivation, the one that motivates. The mind that is behind. In fact, interesting, we can say like this. The first line, commit not a single unwholesome action, you can say, is peace. Cultivate the wealth of virtue is compassion. To tame this mind of ours is wisdom. It's peace, compassion, wisdom, which is basically the three, the wake of the teaching Buddha is summed up into peace, compassion, and wisdom. Is that clear? So the most important thing is, you see, in fact, what I want to share today is a little bit about the mind. You understand? Understanding of the mind. Because that's the most important thing. Understanding a mind, a very being. In fact, even though this is supposed to be a so-called public talk, I never give public talk. <laughs> Actually, I teach directly. To share from the heart of my tradition very much. So he says, as I said earlier, you see, I remember one great master called Myojin Khan, which used to say, the entire teaching of Buddha is summed up into just one line, Ranga Samyongsa, to tame this mind of ours. Extraordinary. In fact, Dalama often used to say, Buddhism is not about, like even in Vajrayana, <coughs> like in the, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, there are many ceremonies, rituals, visualizations, mandala, mantra, he said, even Vajrayana Buddhism is not about mantras, not about visualization, not about rituals. It's fundamentally about transforming the mind. By the way, Buddhism is not Buddhism. Because who calls us Buddhists? You, not we. The term Buddhism is not Buddhism. Is that clear? <laughs> and what do then we call ourselves? Nangpa. Those who seek truth in the nature of mind. So there is actually no ism in the Dharma. It's completely, I've got no limitation. Some extraordinary, normal. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So the most important thing is the third line, to tame this mind of ours. Because you see, mind is the root of everything is the creator of happiness and also creator of suffering. Creator of also what we call samsara and creator of what we call nirvana. Now, some of you heard of samsara or nirvana? Samsara is actually, samsara literally means kholwa, means a vicious cycle. Uh, definition of samsara is the cycle of existence of birth and death, characterized by suffering and determined by our harmful emotions and our actions, the karma. That's samsara. It's because of ignorance, negative emotion, we do negative things which bring about suffering. As one, this great saint, Shanti Deva, he said, though longing to be happy in their ignorance, they destroy their own happiness as if it were the worst enemy. Though they wish to get rid of suffering, yet they rush headlong towards it. Poor beings. That's because beings in samsara, neurotically, you know, encircled in the wheel of existence of birth and death. You understand? Samsara is a state of confusion. You understand? Is that clear? Nirvana 
is the opposite. The, literally, the state beyond suffering and sorrow, it can be said to be the state of Buddhahood. Nirvana is the state of ultimate peace. So, in fact, even samsara, not only mind the creator of happiness and the creator of suffering, but also the creator of samsara and creator of nirvana. Is that clear? In fact, as the poet John Milton said in Paradise Lost, the mind is in its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell and hell of heaven. I mean, you know this, you see? This extraordinary thing about this mind is if you know, if you can really know how to conquer your mind and transform your mind or work with your mind. It can be your best asset, the most wonderful thing, mind. Whereas if you do not know how to use your mind well, in fact, mind uses you, thought, emotions overrun you, then it can be just your absolutely nightmare. In fact, actually, many great masters used to say, it is the foolish that go looking for happiness outside of themselves. Because once you go looking for happiness outside of yourself, actually you have no control. It is the wise and learned know that all the cause of happiness is present in ourselves, in our mind and heart. In fact, Dalam often used to say, well, the wonderful thing that we don't have to buy the mind. We have a mind. And it's quite cheap. <laughs> I mean, it can be expensive also, mind it, yeah. And if you, the wonderful thing is that, really wonderful thing about this is that actually if you know how to use your mind, actually happiness is up to you. Happiness is up to you. It is up to you. Really, actually it's extremely good news. You realize that actually it's up to you. If you know how to use your mind, happiness can be yours. If you don't know how to use the mind, suffering is yours. Is that clear? Yeah. Because you see, happiness does not exist objectively. You know that. Otherwise, I think many people have already bought it. The happiness exists only subjectively to one's experience. That's why, you see, the real main point of the teaching Buddha, which says to tame this mind of ours, because if you tame this mind, if you conquer and you transform this mind of ours, then what will happen if you transform your mind, then your very experience, your perception will also be transformed. You understand? Your perception will also be transformed. Your experience will be transformed. Thereby, even the appearance and circumstances will, will appear differently. So all depend upon the mind. Is that clear? We are going quite deep, by the way. So then what you might say, okay, if samsara and nirvana are both state of mind, so then uh, what is the position mind? You know, how, what is, how is it, you know, samsara, how is nirvana? The great master said, samsara is mind turned outwardly, lost in its projection. You got it? Say that. Samsara is mind turned outwardly, lost in its projection. It's samsara. Nirvana is mind turned inwardly, recognizing nature. Say that. Nirvana is mind turned inwardly, recognizing nature. As the great master said, it is not outwardly looking, but inwardly seeing. Samsara is mind turned outwardly, lost in its projections. Nirvana is mind turned inwardly, recognizing nature. Now, here I have to explain a little bit about the mind. By the way, mind and heart are the same thing. When you talk about the teachings, really. Is that generally when you talk about mind, like in the modern world, generally speaking, 
when you talk about mind, people only think of mind as being thoughts and emotions and maybe feelings and all that. But that is merely the only the outer appearance of mind. Like when you talk about the sun, it merely its rays. Rays. You got it? Did you, are you connecting with me? Yes, okay. Because this kind of thing you need to connect together. Okay, then you understand better. In fact, it is really the great, sometimes you see, it must say, you should not only listen with your ears, but with your eyes, with your body, with your mind, with your heart open. Then you hear much more detail. Because in Larabling, in my uh, retreat, main retreat center, we have 400 students who are doing three year retreat. And when you really, uh, on the very high meditation, when we do practices, you see, uh, often when I sit with them, I think there's a quite powerful atmosphere that's created. And that somehow, when I remain in the kind of nature of mind in the deep meditation, it somehow seemed to reflect in the students, and they also reflect back. Very much. That's one of the reasons also when we listen here, when you listen very specially like this, you know, I can see also there's a different quality, slightly different quality to where you are here, your being. Because most important is where you are. Your being. Being. Presence. So you see, generally speaking, we think of mind as just thought and emotions. But thought and emotions just merely the appearance of mind. In teachings we speak of the appearance of mind and essence the nature of mind. Essence and nature of mind is like the sun. Appearance is like the sun's rays. Is that clear? And often in samsara, our mind is turned outwardly lost in the thoughts and emotions, in its projections and in stories, which are endless. Whereas the nirvana is mind turned inwardly, recognizing its true nature, the essence of mind. The ultimate point of meditation is to really Really, the goal of meditation or the purpose of meditation is how to come to know the mind, way of coming to know the mind. In fact, the word meditation is called calm in Tibetan, which means becoming familiar. It's a way to come <coughs> to know your mind, coming to know your mind, and know your mind like using your mind gradually to almost to subtly recognize your mind. And ultimately, is to realize the essence of your mind. Are you following? So, the appearance of mind and essence of mind. And he's what Dalam called it, appearance and reality, he's called it. Reality is actually the essence of mind. So the thing is, you see, basically samsara is mind turned out, lost in its projection in thoughts and emotions. That's why in meditation, it's is really very much the first level of meditation is how to allow all your thoughts and emotions settle in the state of kamba abiding, in the state of uh, natural great peace, very much. And then from out of that deep peace, then the clear insight of the wisdom inside dawns, and there the clarity of mind comes, with which then you can recognize the nature of your mind or the nature of reality. Yeah. Anyway, so this great master Padmasambhava, who brought the teaching of Buddha to Tibet, who is often considered as the second Buddha, he said, don't seek to cut the root of phenomena or don't investigate the root of phenomena, investigate the root of mind. Once the root of mind had been found, 
you will know one thing, yet all is thereby freed or dissolved. But if the root of mind you fail to find, you will know everything but nothing understand. So most important thing is you see very much. You see, the real problem is just we are always outwardly looking. You understand? Outwardly looking. A mind is turned outwardly, you lost in its projections. And it's story. Story, 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 story. Stories, 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 stories. And after a while, you see, when you get a little bit older, which I am now, you become realize you're just stories. None of the things matter too much anyway. And also, by the way, you know, it's interesting. We have a thought. We take them so seriously. You know, but actually they're not real. It's just a thought. Just a thought. What solidity is there to your thought? What is evidence of your thought? There's no evidence. Just a thought. But also thoughts are no problem. As my master used to say, is thinking about the thought, that's a problem. He used to say, free of afterthought. So, there was also this very great master called Telopa, who is the teacher of this great master called Naropa, the great Pandit Naropa, and whose disciple is the great Tibetan translator called Marpa, and Marpa's disciple is Milarepa, the great Tibetan saint, yogi, poet, who inspired millions of people. When this great master, Telopa, who is in the, there are four major lineages in Tibetan Buddhism. He is the first human master in a very special lineage called Mahamudra. And in his training to this Naropa, this great pundit, he said, Who now am Martin Chin, Chimba Church in Naropa says, Son, it's not the appearances that bind us. He says, Problem is not the phenomena. Problem is not this. But now it is not the parents that bind us, imprison us. It's the attachment, grasping. So if you want to know the main point, cut the grasping, cling. Then you're free of the knot. Push now I'm marching Hembechi, Hembachi Narupa. Son, it is not the parents that binds you, but the grasping, therefore abandon grasping on Narupa. Because you see, mind in its true nature is like a crystal. Mind's true nature is pure, pristine like a crystal. With a crystal, if you put green cloth, it becomes green, yellow cloth becomes yellow, red cloth, it becomes red. But the, is crystal green, red or yellow? No. In the same in a mirror, we can have all kinds of reflections of red, green, white, but the mirror itself is not that. The mind's intrinsic nature is like the mirror, like the crystal, pure and cognizant. In fact, extraordinary, it's because of the openness of mind, called actually the shunyata. <laughs> That's why there's so many possibilities. Because of space, we can have everything, isn't it? Thanks to space. The mind in the intuitive nature is incredibly, infinitely limitless. In fact, in the Buddhist teachings, the most important, uh, like the uh, view ultimate, is called shunyata, tongbanyu. When you translate that, it roughly means emptiness, but not emptiness in a sense of this glass is empty or this cup is empty. Not 
empty in the sense of nothingness. But rather, it's interesting, Izone Dalama uh, said that according to the founder of cognitive therapy, when we have a strong outburst of emotion, anger for example, we mask reality up to 90% by adding on to it all our prejudices and our distorted view of things. So when we see situations from the point of view of anger, we can say there's 90% mental projection and only 10% that really corresponds to reality. On the other hand, if we have a calm and serene mind, it'd be much easier for us to be objective and to see the reality itself. That's why when you talk about Buddhism, about shunyata or the emptiness, is empty of projection, empty of concept. You understand? So that we can see reality itself. That's it. Not empty in the sense of, you see, it's empty, it's nothing. No. But rather, the mind in its infinite nature is limitless and open of all possibilities, infinite possibilities. That mind is the dimension of extraordinary openness. And particularly when we experience deep meditation, we transcend into a state of the great openness, of the great freedom. Is that clear? And from that, you see that, in fact, the word that shunyata, or Tibetan tongpa ni, has two syllables. Tongpa ni. Shunyata. Shunya means kind of empty. Ta, by itself, you know, or a Tibetan ni, itself doesn't make any kind of, on its own, doesn't. But when you add it to, to another, it gives all possibility. I know in some ways it's quite high. I'm just speaking of something quite profound. But actually interesting is that if you really explain, something very profound is also quite simple. And if you understand it, it makes a huge difference. Now, what does this explain the ultimate nature of mind? And in fact, Buddha said about the mind in what's called the Prajan Paramita. In the wisdom teaching, he said, Sem la sem manchi te sem Mind is devoid of mind, for the nature of mind is clear light. So when you say shunyata, on one hand, it is empty, meaning empty in a sense of that. You see, like for example, mind in the intricate nature, like the crystal, is, is open, limitless, empty. You understand? But yet it is not nothing, because there is the quality of cognizance. Quality of cognizance, that means that you see cognitive clarity. Because you see, it, with the nature of mind, we have the openness of the nature of mind, but also the clarity in the cognizance. Particularly when we do the meditation, the most important is maintaining not only the openness of mind, but clarity. Because interesting, if you really maintain clarity, the natural clarity of mind, if you maintain that, then there's no room for darkness, like, you know, no room for negativity to enter, when you're actually in more clarity. So let's go back a little bit, you see. So how do you then turn your mind inwardly? Samsara is mind turned outwardly, loss and projection. Nirvana is mind turned inwardly, recognizing nature. How do we do that? First, you see, samsara is mind turned outwardly, loss and projection. Which means, you know, what, what it really means that most of the time we're scattered, we're just everywhere, and nobody's at home. In fact, we feel homesick for our true nature. We've lost actually the sense of being. As French philosopher Pascal once said, all of men's problem comes from his inability to sit quietly in a room by himself. So the, the main thing, in fact, it's quite simple. The secret is quite simple. 
is just to drop the looking out view. You understand? Looking outwardly. In fact, also, in the teaching, you know, the Tibetan Book of Living Dying, some of you may know that, that the original teaching of that is from the great master Padmasambhava. And the teachings about life and death, teaching on life, teaching on death, there are many, called six pardos. And in that, the main advice that Padmasambhava gave for the part of this life, in this life. What is the main task we have in this life? Is that through wisdom of learning, reflection, and <coughs> meditation, the how to work with, you see, what we need to work with, to work with our perceptions, to overcome our projection. The main thing is the problem with the projections. And to realize the essence of mind, the nature of mind, the compassion of the mind. Is that clear? So therefore, the main thing, one of the main thing is to drop the projection. Projection. Because we are too much into thinking. Thinking and thinking and thought has overtaken us in the stories. Actually, the main thing is dropping the stories, in a sense. I remember one great master, when he used to introduce the nature of mind, he would say, now my hand is turned outwardly. This is how we are our mind is turned outwardly, lost in its projections. He would say, now as I turn my hand this way, this is great master, took again, as I turn my mind like that, would you all turn your mind inwardly? He would say, in that particular moment, he will sit in meditation and then very powerfully introduce uh, the state of nature of mind, which is something non-verbal, you know, which is more through his presence, through his wisdom presence very much. So basically, the key thing is very much just to drop. Just to drop. Just to drop. You got it? Just to drop. To stop. Like, for example, the great master Long Shin Pai said, samsara is like a circle. Circle has no beginning in it, is it? No beginning in it. But there's a beginning if you just cut it. Then there's the beginning, there's the end. So basically, here now, here now, you can stop, you can drop, and allow your mind just quietly settle in the state of calm abiding. There's a very famous saying by the great master of the past. I remember when I first heard this, it has a tremendous impact on me. And it's very beautiful in Tibetan, it says, that means chu is water in Tibetan. Chu. Manyuk is if you don't stir it. Means manyuk. Na means then. Tang means we will clear. That is to say, water, if you don't stir it, will become clear. Is that clear? Water, if you don't stir it, will become clear. In the same manner, sem machu nade. Sem means mind. Machu is when you don't alter, when you don't change. Na means then, de means you find the peace of the well being. That is to say, just as water, if you don't stir it, will become clear. In the same manner, mind left unaltered. Now, this word unaltered. In Tibetan word, machipa, it's so beautiful. Because the word machipa means living in its own naturalness, without any fabrication, without any contriving, without any manipulation. Just living your mind in the unaltered. Just as water, if you don't stir it, will become clear. In the same manner, mind left unaltered will find peace, well-being, happiness, bliss. We'll discover on many different levels, you see. First, you might even experience the deep peace of calm abiding. Then you can also experience the clear seeing of the Vipassana also from that. As well as you can also realize the ultimate nature of the great bliss and of the nature of mind also. That simple two lines says it all. Just as water, 
if you don't stir it, will become clear, mind left unaltered. Unaltered means when you leave it in its own naturalness, without any fabrication, without any manipulation. Just quietly, just like this, see? Just quietly like this. Let's do that, shall we? Sit like me. Body like the mountain, he said. Leave it as it is. Water, if you don't stir it, will become clear. In the same manner, mind left unaltered. Machuka will find its true peace. How are you feeling? And I'll ask you to do, today I'm doing something quite unconventional. I mean, I'm not normally doing. I will ask you to actually look at me. Look at me when you sit. Don't do meditation. In fact, look into me. Don't worry, I'm not hypnotizing you like this because I didn't even know. Just look into me as I leave my mind, because most important is the eye. Eye. Eyes. Not I, eyes. Eyes are the door of wisdom in the highest teaching called the Dzogchen teachings. Particularly if you do not know, you see how to meditate. And then you probably just sit like this and then just fall asleep. So in which case, you just look at me as I'm sitting. Just mimic me. i tell you a little story. Long ago, you see, in ancient India, there were a group of monkeys. They went into this forest and they saw this old rishi a sage who's in meditation, in perfect meditation, and then this old lesson. And the monkeys that jumped and tried to pull here and there, and this and that, you know, that the rishi, the sage, will just remain absolutely peaceful. So they played and tray all the tricks and everything just kind of all finished. And finally they started playing the final game, which is trying to sit like the rishi, like the sage. So as they sat with him, they all looked at the rishi and then, you know, sat with him like that sage. You know. They all sat like that. And afterwards, actually, all of them attained the samadhi, a deep state of meditation. So therefore, like that, that if you uh, sit with me like this, particularly what I'm sharing with you something subtle, it's not something, it's not technique that involves watching the breath, like mindfulness meditation, or watching the image of Buddha, or watching the breath, not that. It's more in the dimension of more, of like a little bit the state of transcendence, where you go a little bit beyond even meditation, so to call, to the state of, how do you say, nature mind. In this, the most important thing is just as water, if you don't stir it, will become clear, mind left unaltered, will find its true peace. Something extraordinary is 
the greatest change you can bring about is actually by not changing, by not altering. Secret is not altering. In Dzogchen, the key thing is not altering, machupa, unaltering. In fact, this great master, Longchenpa, very great master, Dzogchen master, he said, machu machiranga sen machu, manzin manziranga sen machu, chishin chishin ranga sen ki which when you draft this answer into English, it says, do not alter, do not alter, do not alter this mind of ours. Do not grasp, do not grasp, do not grasp at this mind of ours. See, do not alter, do not alter, do not alter this mind of ours. Do not grasp, do not grasp, do not grasp at this mind of ours. Alter and alter, it will only stir up the cloudy depths of mind. Mind that is altered will obscure the ultimate nature. So the main key thing is not altering and not grasping. In fact, the whole point of meditation is to reach to that level where you can remain in this, the unaltered state. And then the state that it actually also you become free of grasping. You understand? And then in the state of free of grasping, then the most important thing becomes clarity. The clarity, maintaining the clarity. Clarity, the clarity of mind. Now, the method of how to realize the mind is the process of meditation. Meditation is a process of getting to know your own mind. In fact, the Tibetan word for meditation is gom or kom, which means becoming familiar with. Basically means getting to know your own mind. That's the meaning of meditation. As Nguyen Ken was used to say. The first basic practice of meditation involves allowing your mind to settle in a state of calm abiding or peace. This is Sanskrit, this practice is known as shamatha. In Tibetan, it's called shine. Shama, in Sanskrit, Tibetan, she may be understood in a variety of ways, including calm, peace, rest, or cooling down from a state of mental and emotional or a sensory excitement. Maybe a modern equivalent could be chilling out. <laughs> the Sanskrit word ta, a Tibetan ne, the second syllable, shi ne, shama ta, means to abide, to dwell or to stay. In other words, Shamat or shine means abiding in a state that is rested, or as you can say, chilled out, that allows the mind to just rest in one place for a while. So shamata or shine can also be translated as calm abiding, peacefully remaining, or tranquility meditation. Main point of shamatha is to bring stability to the mind. Because just now mind is all over. And very fickle. And lose its strength. In fact, you know Dalai Lama one teaching in Glasgow a few years ago. He said that the, the meditation is the way to gather the mind and to gain its strength so that it is conducive to virtue. So, then going on a deeper level, you see, if you were to ask, what is really meditation? Or even shamatha, on a deeper level to understand. 
It is said, the essence and the whole foundation of a shamatha is the state of non-distraction. State of non-distraction. Is that clear? Now there are two kinds of shamatha. Shamatha with support, which means using an object, you know, like an image of Buddha, a sound of mantra, or watching a breath, using that as a support, using this object as a support of your meditation. That is shamatha with support. Then there's also shamatha without support or without an object. In some ways, it's that, that shamatha without support is really actually the real foundation of meditation is shamatha without support. But we train because we are at the beginning not able to just immediately enter into the state of non-distraction. We need something to support, something to focus on, something to anchor us. Is it clear? So practice shamatha, you, you focus your attention, for example, on the image of Buddha, or a sound of mantra, or watching the breath. These three methods I use in my work in Rigpa. We bring these three methods together. We call them unifying practice. Because these three has an aspect of body, speech, and mind. You know, bringing them into the wholeness. But then, one that's very common to all schools of Buddhism is lightly watching, or focusing on the breath. Now, I'm not going into details of this because we do not have time, but really to map out. Always this great master, Eugene Karen Bacchier, he often used to say, Really, mapping out is the most important. The crucial point, if you get the crucial point, the details will come. Sometimes we have details. If you don't see the main point, then you lose it. Anyway, please be a little bit patient, you know, okay? The goods are coming slowly. <laughs> Even when you come to a restaurant, you have to wait for a while for the dessert. So be patient, okay? Patience is really a virtue. Because I'm really trying to share you the highest, the most important things, really. I feel that the world needs it so much. It's the most precious thing we have. The most precious wealth. I think this is perhaps the greatest contribution of Buddha, Buddhism, and particularly the Tibetan tradition. No, very much. Now, so you begin first using an image of Buddha or lightly watching the breath. That's the first step of meditation using shamatha with support. Once you have mastered that little bit, then you see in the same way as you use the image of the Buddha or the sound of mantra or your breath as an object, then start working on the senses, the form, the sound, all the senses. Because normally the senses are the, uh, that which causes distraction. You know the senses? You understand? Cause distraction. And often the source of suffering. So next level, you will work with all the senses. Like when you hear a noise, like in the middle of meditation, if somebody makes a noise, you say, bloody hell. <laughs> you such a bloody hell, you lose all your calmness, you see. <laughs> Instead of that, you use that same sound, then the distraction into meditation. So therefore, what happens is every situation, whatever arises, is an invitation to meditation. Instead of an obstacle. Then, after working with the senses, then you can even work with thoughts and emotions. You directly, just as you use the image of the Buddha as an object, you, know, you can just also, as we progress through training and reach the level of having used senses and able to do so, then you can even look at the thoughts. Like when thought arises, immediately you're able to look at the thoughts. If you do so, something interesting can happen. There are two experiences. The first, which is mostly for the beginner, is that 
moment you look at it, the thought, it becomes like watching a movie. In the movie, you see everything on the screen, but you are not in the movie. You understand? There becomes a little bit of space between your thought and yourself. Is that clear? The second experience, which happens more for an experienced practitioner, but it also happens to beginners also, is that sometimes the moment you look at thoughts, really, it dissolves. Once, when Eugene Kennedy asked me to just watch the thoughts, I was quite embarrassed because there was nothing there. <laughs> and I very felt that, you know, I didn't want to make a fool of myself, <laughs> which is also the ego. If you're truly a student, you can really make a fool of yourself. Not purposely, <laughs> but you know, making a fool of yourself is nothing wrong with that. It was for a good purpose. Then after a lot of, you see, a kind of a beckoning from camp. I just said, well, I'm sorry, I might be doing it wrong, but you see, the moment look at the dissolve. Oh, that's very good, he said. That's exactly. The moment you watch the dissolve, so that happens. Similarly, with also with emotions. Emotions. Having mastered this, this practice to a certain extent, then you see, shamatha without support is when you rest your mind naturally in a state of non-distraction, and you're able to continue to remain undistracted. This is called shamatha without support. When you first hear about resting the mind naturally, you might have no idea what it means. You might wonder, but how am I supposed to just rest my mind without something to rest on? Well, the way to do this is to rest your mind as though you have just finished a long day's work. As Dujun used to say, imagine a man comes home after a long, hard day of work in the fields, sings into his favorite chair in front of his fire. He has been working all day and he knows that he has achieved what he wanted to achieve. There's nothing more to worry about, nothing left accomplished. He can let go of completely all the cares and concerns, content, simply to be. That example is very helpful. So basically just let go and relax that way. Whatever thoughts, emotions or sensations arise, you do not have to block them also. But neither do you have to follow them. Just rest open in the present moment, simply allowing Whatever rises to rise, if thoughts and emotions come up, just allow them, allow yourself to be aware of them. Just rest. Don't worry, I won't sit for a very long time. <laughs> In Shamatha, without support, even though you're not particularly focused on anything, there's a still some presence of mind that may be loosely described as a center of awareness. 
You may not be focused on anything particular, such as your breath, but you're still aware, still present with whatever happening here and now. When you practice Shamatha without support, we're actually resting the mind in its natural clarity or awareness, or natural clarity or natural awareness, completely unaffected by whatever thoughts and emotions rise. Just as space is not defined by the object that moves through it, awareness is not defined or limited by thoughts, emotions, and perceptions that it perceives, you see. Awareness simply is. So the basic instruction for practicing chamatha without support is simply not to follow after thoughts and emotions and merely to be aware of everything that passes through your awareness as it is. Now going deeper. Meditation has many stages or levels, but the true purpose or the highest goal of meditation is to waken in us the sky-like -like nature of mind and introduce us to who we really are, our unchanging pure awareness which underlies the whole of life and death. As we said earlier, there are two aspects to the mind. The mind's outer aspect of thoughts and emotions, which we call the appearance of mind. And there is the essence and the nature of mind. When we die, not only our body dies, but the outer level of our ordinary mind, with all its thoughts and emotions, also die for a short time. As this happens, what is revealed is the ultimate nature, or the nature of mind, sometimes teaching known as ground luminosity, or the clay light. The great Tibetan saint and yogi, Milarepa, once said, in horror of death, I took to the mountains, and again and again, I meditated on the uncertainty of the hour of death. Then capturing, finally, the fortress of the deathless, unending nature mind, now all fear of death is done and over with. By practicing meditation, you see, you go into the deeper aspect of your mind, you see, beyond thoughts, emotions, and you discover your true nature or the nature of mind. Through this realization, you completely overcome all your thoughts and emotions, but in fact, you actually overcome yourself. You go beyond yourself. And you completely overcome your thoughts and emotions, therefore you also overcome all your fears. Even in the face of death, you're not afraid, because you realize what dies is your ordinary mind, but not the nature of your mind. In a sense, it's like as if you lose the clouds, but you gain the sky. I mean, for those of you who are a little bit familiar with the Tibetan Book of Living Dying, you see the first three chapters outline the interplay of life and death, culminating in the end of chapter three, the section called Changeless which goes deeply into this, which then leads to the nature of mind. I always quote this Miller Ripa's quote. One wonderful thing is that 
You see, when we realize that since everything is impermanent, everything dies, then you ask, what is that really true? What is that is lasting? That's why Milarepa searched for. But you have to realize extraordinarily through really deeply reflecting on impermanence that you come slowly when you come to discover nature might. Something that is deathless, something that is unchanging, the nature might. You understand? Then read to chapter four, nature might. So the whole purpose of meditation is to transcend our ordinary mind to discover a fundamental nature which we have lost touch with. When you actually come to contact with your true nature and experience it directly, it's extremely powerful. This realization actually frees you of yourself, opens up completely, and you experience a tremendous sense of well-being, even physically, and emotionally, an extraordinary transformation of healing can take place. So the ultimately, the most important thing for us to do is to realize the nature of mind. That's really the main point of the teaching of the Buddha. So now you see the profound method for bringing forth or invoking the nature of mind, you see. One very profound way of understanding meditation on the deepest level is using mind to recognize the mind. Got it? Say it. Using mind to recognize the mind. In this case, we're talking about a very special way of using mind to look at the mind. It's not kind of, as you say, probing mind, investing mind, kind of intellectually, but experiencing in a very special way. It is as the famous saying goes, it's not outwardly looking, but inwardly seeing. As we mentioned before, samsara's mind turned outwardly, lost in projection, Nirvana's mind turned inwardly, recognizing nature. In fact, to give an example to illustrate this, looking at the mind is like trying to see your own face without a mirror. You know you have a face, and you may have some idea of what it looks like, but that idea is a bit fuzzy. Similarly, we know we have a mind, but it features obscure by overlapping thoughts, feelings, and sensations, which are further obscured by thought, feelings, about our thoughts, feelings, and sensations, which are even further obscured by thoughts, feelings, and sensations, about our thoughts, feelings, and so on. So the mind is always active. More often than not, we find ourselves captivated by all this activity. So looking at all this activity of thoughts, emotions in our mind seems as normal and a natural looking through a window at a traffic on the street. You see, caught up in the habit of looking through a window, we do not recognize that the window itself is what enables us to see. Turning the mind to look at the mind is like looking at the window itself rather than focusing only on what is seen through it. By doing this, we begin to gradually recognize that the window and what we see through it exist simultaneously. Look out a window in one direction, we will see things in a particular way. Look in a different direction, we will see things in a little differently. But if we take a step back and look at the entire window, we can begin to recognize these limited perspectives as different aspects of much vaster panorama. 
there is an unlimited realm of activity that passes through the window, but this activity does not affect the whole window itself. In the same manner, as the passing thoughts, emotions, sensations visible through our minds do not affect our mind itself. Is that clear? Here, at this point really, when you go really deeper, it is at this point that the introduction to the nature of mind is affected. On a deeper level, using mind to recognize the mind is where you see, like Tukul Genambach used to say, you see, samsara's mind turned outwardly lost in projection, nirvana's mind turned inwardly recognized nature. You see, another profound way of understanding, recognizing meditation on a really deeper level is simply resting in the natural state of your present mind without manipulating or contriving. As you know, there's this wonderful saying by the great master Pass. I first heard from Kalur who was a very great master. In Tibetan is very beautiful. I think I mentioned on many occasions because I found this so helpful. Each time I say it again, it really brings the kind of profundity again, direct experience, which Tibetan is very beautiful. Chumma nyuk natang semma chunate. Most musical. Chu in Tibetan means water. Manyuk is when you don't stir it. Na means then. Tang means will be clear. So water, if you don't stir it, will become clear. His old Dalam will say that a fact. <laughs> okay? Water, if you don't stir it, will become clear. Now, in the same manner, sem machu nade, sem is mind. Machu is when you don't alter. When you don't alter, that means when you do not manipulate or fabricate or contrive, but leave it in its own naturalness. In fact, a Tibetan word is called machupa. Machupa is such a beautiful word. Machupa is when you leave it completely unaltered in the naturalness of naturalness in the simplicity of natural abiding. Machupa. So, sem, mind, unaltered, machu, na, then, de. De means peace, also could be well-being, happiness, and also bliss. In fact, it could be related to many levels, this saying, on the basic shamatha level, then on the vipassana level, and on the dukshan level and the Mahamudra level, which are almost one and the same thing anyway. So water, if you don't stir it, will become clear. Mind left unaltered will find true peace. These two lines are very simple and extremely profound. In fact, these two lines show what the nature of mind is and how to abide by the recognition of this, which is the meditation at the highest level. So just leave your mind unaltered, which in Tibetan is machupa, which means unfabricated, uncontrived, in its own natural, in its own naturalness is machupa, leave your mind unaltered, which means neither following the past, the masters neither follow your past thoughts, nor anticipate the future, but remain unaltered in the present pure awareness, in the state of Machupa. In fact, quite extraordinarily, not altering your mind brings about the greatest change. You understand? Really. In fact, this great Dzogchen master, the great master, he's one of the greatest masters in the Tibetan tradition. There are, uh, you know, four, four different schools. There's the great uh, Sakya Pandita. There's the Longchenpa from the Nyingma tradition, Meladepa and Tsongkhapachampa. Particularly Longchenpa, Sakya Pandita, and 
Tsongkhapa Chimpa, known as Three Manjushris. They're all, three of them are emanation of Buddha wisdom, Manjushri. In fact, this great master, Long Shinpa, omniscient master, Long Shinpa, in his what is called semi round natural freedom of the nature mind, in that famous teaching of his, in that he said, Machu, Machu, Rangi Sen Machu, Manjin, Manjin, Rangi Sen Manjin, Chu Xin, Chu Xin, Sen Chin, Nyong Hong Pei, Chu Mi Sen Chin, Nyong Hong Pei, Chu now, when you roughly translate that into English, machu machi rong se machu mean do not alter, do not alter, do not alter this mind of ours. Manzi manzi rang se manzi means do not grasp, do not grasp, do not grasp at this mind of ours. Chu xin chu xin sen jin nyo long pe, chu mi sen jin nyo butan ba Alter and alter, you will stir up the cloudy depths of your mind and the mind that is altered obscures its own true nature. So in a very simple way, the two key thing is, really the secret is unaltering, machipa, and manzimpa, which is ungrasping. Got it? In fact, when you're in the state of machupa and manzimpa and grasping, you're actually in the nature of mind. Our real problem is manipulation and fabrication through too much thinking. One master used to say that the root cause of all our mental problem is too much thinking. But on the other hand, if we allow our mind to rest quietly in the natural state, what happens then is, as we practice, quite extraordinary. When you rest unaltered in the state of Machupa, since there is no fabrication, no thinking, the cloud-like thoughts and emotions have no room to gather. As they rise, they immediately dissolve back into the sky-like nature of mind. And finally, another profound way of describing meditation is allowing yourself to be simply and clearly present in the face of whatever thoughts, sensations, and emotion arises. It is impossible to keep our mind from generating thoughts or feelings or sensations. This is because you cannot block the mind. In fact, thinking is the natural function of the mind. Just as the natural function of the sun is produced light and warmth. But this does not mean that you need to be carried away by your thoughts, especially by your emotions. Whatever your mind says, you don't have to listen to it. Sometimes, you know, really kind of the grandfatherly wisdom in Tibet. Especially in Kam, Kampas, they'll say, you know, if somebody eats shit, you don't have to. <laughs> Means, you see, thoughts are that stink anyway. Now, you don't have to, thoughts come, you don't have to listen to it. It's not yours. Thoughts are thoughts. Mind is always active, always generating thoughts, just as ocean constantly generates waves. We cannot stop our thoughts any more than we can stop the waves in the ocean. Arresting the mind in its own natural state is very different from trying to stop thoughts altogether. So meditation does not in any way involve attempting to make your mind blank, even if you could manage to stop your thoughts you will not be meditating. In fact, you will be drifting to a zombie-like state. On the other hand, you may find that as soon as you look at the thoughts, emotions, or sensations, it dissolves immediately, as I mentioned before. Even when thoughts and feelings elude you like this, as long as you are 
maintaining the sense of bare attention, not B E A R bare, B A R E bare. You know, maintain the sense of bare attention or bare awareness. You'll be experiencing the natural clarity and the openness of your mind's true nature. So the real point of meditation, or the crucial point, is to rest in the bare attention, in the naked awareness, regardless of whether anything rises or not. Whenever something does rise, don't get entangled or caught up in it. Just be open, present to it. Just said, let it be, or let it go. If nothing rises, or if thoughts and emotions dissolve before you can even notice them, just rest in the natural clarity. You see, how wonderful this is, isn't it? How much more simple it can be than this? In meditation, we simply observe our physical intellectual, emotional experience without judgment. Meditation is really a process of non-judgmental awareness. Also, you simply observe a physical, intellectual, emotional experience without judgment. Although we cling to the ideas of some experiences better than, or more appropriate, or more productive than others, there are in fact no good thoughts or bad thoughts, ultimately. There are only thoughts. Even though we say good thoughts or bad thoughts, they're simply our interpretation, our commentary, our labeling. Especially, you see, you know, whenever you have, you know, for example, like a, a negative experience, like an ominous sign, like a bad omen comes. Gundalam often said that, you know, really, I remember, that you see, it's really, even if some bad signs come, most important is your reaction. You understand? How you interpret it. Even if a bad sign is, if you not see it as negative, then it will not be ominous. So it's the mind that interprets, the afterthought, that makes it. Thoughts are neither good, you see, or bad. We're talking especially in meditation, when you reach that level. You go beyond both goodness and good and bad. You see. Most of us, we trained in believing that if we think something is good, then it's good. If we think something is bad, then it's bad. But as we practice simply watching our thoughts come and go, the rigid distinctions between good thoughts and bad thoughts begin to dissolve. The most important, no hope and fear. It's the hope and fear. I don't mean ha not having hope, I don't mean that. But the expectation and the fear are the greatest obstacle. It is said in the Dzogchen teachings, even if you experience, even if a demonic kind of, a, how do you say, apparition appears to you, if you have no really fear, actually it becomes a blessing. Even if a Buddha appears to you, if you have attachment, too much expectation to your visions, then it becomes an impediment. So the hope and fear are the demons. If you continue to simply allow ourselves to be aware of the activity of mind, then we will gradually come to recognize the transparent nature of thoughts, emotions, sensations and perceptions that we once considered to be very solid and real. It is as though the layers of dust and dirt are slowly being wiped away from the mirror of your mind and its surface is becoming clearer and clearer. As you grow accustomed to looking at the clear surface of our minds, we begin to see through all the gossips about who and what we think we are. And we begin to recognize instead the shining essence of our true nature. This is what will truly bring us peace and stability in the troubled world on a deeper level.
Is that clear? And then you realize also that you're much bigger than your thoughts and emotions. Anyway. Then you become free. I share this really, these actually very profound teachings with the hope because I know there are many who are also practitioners that it may really help you in your endeavor to develop, to recognize. I know it's evident for you, isn't it? When you're able to bring your in into that state, then you see, even though the world may be complex, but you find the inner simplicity or the carefree dignity with which we can face the complexity of the world with ease, with humor, and with compassion, very much. And we need that. Thank you very much. I think when I saw that how way you were listening, I think perhaps, I think you are beginning to understand, isn't it? <laughs> Did you realize something today? Yes. And then remember this again and again. Keep it and practice it and apply it to yourself and benefit others. Thank you.